been here not as long as Fred's people, but we were here like two years later, so I still think we've been a while. Um, I, uh, I live in Grand Island now, but uh, Alba Wood River area is what I call my hometown. I grew up south of Alba on a farm, uh, right across the section from where my mom grew up, my grandpa lived. And when he was a kid, um, I graduated from Wood River High School, just like my mom and my grandpa and a whole bunch of family members before me. So Hall County is definitely my home and the home of my family, and I'm very excited to be on the board and all the things I'm doing, and I have a great group of people I work with. So. Uh, but today I'm going to talk to you a little bit about the history of the Hall County newspapers. And then I'll get into the newspaper project that we've got going on. And then give you a little taste of what you might be expecting to find when this project gets up and running. So, to get started, the first newspaper in Hall County actually didn't start in Hall County. Uh, the Platte Valley Independent actually started in North Platte in January of 1870. Uh, Maggie Everhart, she was a school teacher, and Seth Mobley, he had some experience working in printing shops. They joined forces and started the Platte Valley Independent in uh, North Platte. However, their very first issue said that it was serving the Platte River Valley, including Grand Island, and they ran on businesses were advertising for that very first issue. So even though it was published in North Platte, it had a really strong connection to Grand Island. Maggie, and we talked about her a little bit in April, and, and actually um, I just finished in July um, my second master's. I graduated from UNK with my master's in history. Um, and Maggie actually was the subject of my thesis. Um, and I am the only person apparently who ever has had my thesis embargoed at UNK, which means it can't be published for two years because I'm working on a book about Maggie and I found some information about her um, that people had gotten wrong all those years. So hopefully within the next two years I can get my book published before the embargo expires. But anyway, Maggie was very opinionated and outspoken. Shocker to those who didn't know that. Um, and in June she took on a shop foreman from the Pacific Shops and she called him a dastardly individual. He had the heart of a devil. Um, he was threatening workers, he was extorting workers, and she stopped just short, but not very much short, of calling him a thief and saying that he was stealing from the railroad and to build with building materials for his own house. So uh, she was right after that issue, before the next issue came out, because it was a weekly publication, uh, she left North Platte. The next issue said she was living in Grand Island, and that's where they would set up their operation. So, the very first issue of the Platte Valley Independent Publishing Grand Island was July 2nd of 1870, and they continued to operate the paper until January 24th, or January of 1884, um, when they sold it to J.W. JW Livinger House. Um, he ran the newspaper for about six months. He turned the paper from a weekly into a daily newspaper and renamed it the Grand Island Independent. Um, and about six months later, in July of 1884, he sold the paper to Fred Hetty, who was one of the original settlers. Um, came out with Fred's great grandfather, great great grandfather. Um, but he was a newspaper man in Germany, and he had some other newspaper interests, and so he bought the Independent in July of 1884, and he ran it until 1900. So. There were a whole lot of newspapers published in Hall County, and I'm going to run through um, all of them I can find for the most part. Um, there are some who were really short-lived, had very specific purposes, and didn't have their own publishing houses. Um, I'll kind of talk through some of the, the more prevalent ones, but the Grand Island Times was started in July of 1873. That was started by Charles P.R. Williams, and it was in direct opposition of the Platte Valley Independent. Now, the Platte Valley Independent, and at that time, um, newspapers very much proclaimed what party they were affiliated with. The Independent was decidedly Republican. What's interesting, though, is the Times was also a Republican newspaper. Um, but they had different philosophies 
and there were a lot of issues um, between Maggie and Williams and Williams supporters about political issues in Hall County. So the time started in 1873, and um, during the election season of that year, for the most part, it was a weekly publication, just like The Independent, um, but they began a daily evening times during the heat of the election process. Um, the Times editor and the editor of The Independent, who was Maggie, um, continued to trade bars with one another until um, Maggie sold The Independent in uh, 1884, and then I think there was still a little contention between the end of the Times until it ceased publication in 1894. And I don't know exactly why they stopped publishing, but I think it had something to do with um, the financial crisis in the 1890s, and their subscription base had dropped to a point that they couldn't sustain anymore. The Independent was just a stronger newspaper at that time. They had more subscribers. There was another short-lived paper in 1874, and I'm going to talk about that one because um, J.L. Wiley, he was the editor of the Mirror, and the Mirror was one of those papers they didn't have their own in-house printing press, and so they relied on the offices of the Independent and the Times to publish their newspaper. Started first with the Independent and then later the Times, um, because apparently they weren't paying their bills at the Independent, they couldn't pay for it anymore. Um, apparently that must have ticked off Mr. Wiley um, because he wrote a really scathing editorial about Maggie. So that was kind of really his claim to fame was he wrote this really nasty editorial about this female editor and she met him outside the meeting hall with her whip. And it made national newspapers that uh, this editor cow hired the pick up man. So um, that's kind of the mirror's claim to fame. It was really short-lived. Uh, the Grand Island Democrat was first published by George Dufferin um, and served as another voice again. Like I said, the Independent of the Times were Republican. The Grand Island Democrat was very much a Democrat newspaper. Um, it offered opposing views to both publications. Um, it briefly stopped operations, um, but then it was started up again in 1896 by um, a man named Richard who was a representative of Jeffersonian and Jacksonian principles, um, but the paper really was advertised as serving um, for a vehicle of democratic and populist ideas. It was in the height of, of the populist era, so that was really kind of what the Democrat was all about until Irving Augustine, and you're gonna hear his name a few times too. Um, he was a publisher of a newspaper called The Free Press. Um, when the Democrat uh, stopped Publishing, he actually bought the newspaper and he just absorbed it into his own newspaper, the Free Press. So Fred Hetty, he's the one that I told you about the Independent from uh, in 1884. But before that, he and a group of men um, decided to start their own newspaper, and that was called um, the Anti-Monopolist. They started in 1883, and it was really to talk about how they were dissatisfied and show their displeasure um, with the railroad monopoly and the politics that were involved with the railroad. Um, they had the newspaper, uh, Hetty did buy out his partner shortly after they started, but then in 1884 when he bought the Independent, he merged those two papers together. So that's when the anti-monopolist stopped printing. Um, when Hetty retired from the Independent in 1900, uh, it was reported that he was perhaps the oldest editor in the United States when he laid down his pen. Uh, I don't know how old Ed Hetty would have been in 1900. He was, he was not a young man when he came in the 1850s. He was in his 30s, so he would have been probably in his 80s. Probably his 80s is when he retired from the newspaper business. Um, but then the Independent continued local operations. Uh, they had a group of young newspaper workers who had an association with the business, and they were backed by a group of investors who bought the paper from Hay. And they continued operating the paper locally um, until the 1930s when a company in Kansas called Stocker Communications bought it. Uh, and then it changed hands a few times. Uh, 1995, Morse Communications, another out of state company, bought it. 
uh, Gate House Media bought it in 2007, again out of state. Uh, and then in 2008, the Independent actually came back to control in Nebraska when the Omaha Herald bought it from Gateway, Gate House. Uh, and then um, today, the, um, the Omaha World Herald and the Independent and all of the other newspapers under that umbrella are owned by PH Media, which is Berkshire Hathaway. The, um, the Der Herald was a German paper. It was started by Henry Garn. He was a school teacher and Charles Bull. Uh, Garn had come to Grand Island in 1866, so right after the Civil War. Um, Bull sold out to, to Garn in 1883, and Garn started publishing two newspapers. There was the Herald, H-E-R-A-L-D, which was the English language newspaper, and the Herald, the H-A-R-O-L-D, which was the German uh, newspaper. Uh, he ran both of those until he sold them. Um, in 1888-1889, he sold the papers uh, the English version went to Ed Hall, who operated the paper out of the Bartonback Opera House building. Um, and then G. M. Hine, who also published two other German newspapers, one was called the Wubblack, and one was the Anziger. Um, he purchased the German language of the Herald and merged all those papers together to establish the Anziger Herald. Um, which continued publishing until December, or not December, but in 1918. Uh, what happened in 1918? World War I, the Council of Defense. Um, and it was said that the, the newspaper did absolutely nothing wrong, but the Council of Defense um, made it stop publishing the German language newspaper. So at that time, um, it just continued under the name of the Herald, the ALD, the English language version. So um, the Augustine brothers, and we'll hear about them a little bit later on too, because they had um, run a newspaper in Donovan. Um, when they decided to leave Donovan, come to Grand Island, uh, in 1895, they established a newspaper called the Free Press. Um, George Augustine sold out his interest to Irving, his brother, um, who continued to operate the paper as a democratic-leaning paper until they sold their interest to the Grand Island Independent. Again, a lot of consolidation. Papers would get absorbed by other paper, um, and that's how some of them ended up ceasing publication. So Seth Mobley, back on the original Pop Valley Independent, after they sold that newspaper, he actually stayed on and worked in the independent offices as a business manager for a while. But then in 1893, at the World's Fair in Chicago, Seth was the uh, commissioner for Nebraska. So he was in Chicago for a couple of years uh, doing that. When he came back to Nebraska, he wanted to get back in the newspaper business himself. Uh, so he started a newspaper called the Central Nebraska Republican. And he started operations of that and continued until about 1898 um, when he sold it to Penn Fedora, who owned the paper for a year. And then he sold his interest to Irving Augustine of the Free Press. So again, a lot of consolidation. Um, Henry Garn established a German newspaper uh, called The Courier. Um, it was first a German paper advocating Republican principles in 1897. Changed hands several times before, in 1901, it was purchased by The Independent and stopped operations. Uh, and again, there were a lot of smaller newspapers, really short-lived, like I said. Sometimes people had specific interests um, that maybe they weren't attracting subscribers or advertisers. And if the newspapers didn't have advertisers and they don't have subscribers, they don't have any money coming in, obviously they're not going to be in operation for a while. So some of those are listed up there. I didn't talk about those specifically, um, but things like the Orchard and Vineyard, which was an agrarian journal. It was all about agriculture. Um, the Grand Island Journal, the Grand Island Workman, um, which was a labor type newspaper, uh, the Daily Press, the Weekly Journal, and the Morning Bulletin. 
So those were those were the newspapers published in Grand Rapids. A lot of newspapers published in a town of the size that Grand Island was, um, you know, at the turn of the century. So we've had a lot of newspapers, and we only have one that is still being printed today. And next summer we'll celebrate its 150th birthday. Personally, because like I said, she was the subject of my thesis. I think it's pretty cool. The woman's paper outlasted all these others and is still being published today. Because she was a woman working in a male dominated industry and she had a lot of enemies because of it. So I think it's kind of cool if her paper survived and everyone else has either got absorbed or folded up. Okay, so the other newspapers in Holland County. Um, obviously, we have several different communities in Holland County. Um, and there's one. Um, Alva, I wanted to mention, my, uh, where I grew up by. Um, they did actually try to start a newspaper in Alva. It was very short-lived, didn't have a lot of support, and folded up. That's all I know about it. I don't even know the name, who started it, anything. But I do know that there was an attempt to start a newspaper in, in Alva, but not very successful or long. Uh, but in Cairo, um, there was a newspaper started in Cairo in um, 1902. It was established by J.H. Harrison. It's called the Cairo Record. And it's also the Cairo like, Agricultural Record. There's a couple different things it was called by. For the most part, it was the Cairo Record. Um, he was then succeeded in short order by several people who kind of switched hands a couple times, um, or editors switched hands. Um, Elliot Hand Harrison took over from J.H. Um, and then A.C. Ophield, and then W.H. Daly, until a man by the name of John Warren Matthew purchased the newspaper in 2018, or 1918, sorry. <coughs> 1918, Matthew was um, an Irishman, but he had a lot of experience in the newspaper business, and he purchased the Carroll newspaper, and supposedly had a lot of really strong support from the community, the subscribers, and from businesses that were advertising. So the paper continued, um, and then in 2015, Kara Roberts stopped publishing, um, and it was actually kind of merged in with the Shelton Clipper. Uh, today, the Clipper serves the communities of uh, Shelton, Kara, River, and Alda. But so there's only one newspaper in Kara. Donovan was a little different story. Um, Donovan had a lot of newspapers for a little town. Uh, the very first paper published in Donovan was actually called the Donovan Leader in 1884. Um, however, in, on November 26th of 1887, there was a big fire in Donovan that um, took out a lot of the town and a lot of the town records. So I don't know, as far as I know, there is no record anymore. There is no newspaper for the Donovan Leader. Um, there's no issues today that remain. There was another newspaper published in about 1888, which is, Donovan was a really young town at this time. Um, it was established in like 1879. Yes, 1879 is when Donovan was established. So by 1888, there was a second newspaper that was established called The Index. Um, Charles Kelsey, he was a man from Hastings. He moved to Donovan, and he ran that newspaper for about 11 years. Um, and then, but during that same period of time, the Augustine brothers, George and Irvin Augustine, and their father had been a minister, and he traveled, um, he moved a lot around the state, so the brothers, kind of the whole family, um, moved with the father and his ministry. And when he came to central Nebraska, of course his family came along, and his son started a newspaper in Donovan um, called The Eagle. Um, it, they published there from 1890 to 1895. And like I said, at that point, it was a Democratic newspaper too. They were very much um, supporting the Democratic Party. Um, but in 1895, they sold, or they stopped publishing The Eagle. They came to Grand Island and started the Free Press. And then like I said, Irving bought out George. And then Irving um, like, he became a respected newspaper man. He had a lot of newspapers, but he also had a big printing company. And probably most of people remember the name um, Augustine Printing Company. Uh, Camp Augustine, that's kind of his family too. So, 
Um, and then Donovan, after the index folded, Donovan went for a few years without a newspaper uh, until a young man, Charles Bierhau, Bierbauer, um, came to town. And he'd actually started a newspaper with his brother over in Giltner first. It was called the Giltner Gazette. And they ran it together over there for several years. And then Bierbauer um, decided to start a Sunday newspaper. So he went to Donovan. He was 24 years old when he started this newspaper, so pretty impressive. And remember, he'd been operating a gazette in Giltner for a while, too, so pretty ambitious young man. Uh, so he started the uh, Donovan Enterprise in 1914. He continued a weekly publication. And about the 1920s is when he um, left Donovan, about 1921. Um, what I was able to find from him is it looked like he went to maybe the Denver area and continued working in publishing in newspapers in Colorado is what it looked like. Um, so then the there's a short little gap and then another newspaper started called the Donovan Enterprise. Uh, Roy Minder, he was a publisher of the um, or the Don of the Donovan Herald, sorry, for Donovan Herald. Roy Minder was the publisher of the Herald. It began printing on April 10th, 1923. Um, it published for uh, about um, 15 years. Uh, 1937 was when it stopped publishing and ceased publication. I don't know the reason exactly. It might have been, again, finances, you know, right after the Great Depression. You know, a lot of, there could be a lot of different things. But it did stop publishing in 1937. And then Donovan went for a long time without a newspaper all the way to 1971, when the Herald was reborn. And today is still being published. Uh, and they have a great little newspaper there too. Um, but they started there again in 1971 and continue today. And they serve um, Donovan, Trumbull, and Gilner with the Donovan Herald. So out in Wood River, again, kind of my home territory, um, there are actually three newspapers, and, and technically there's one people always think of as being the very first newspaper in Home County, and sometimes I think it's whatever, but it's really kind of more Shelton. Um, that was called the Huntsman Echo. Um, that was published in the 1860s. Um, there was a Mormon who had a road ranch, and he was actually publishing a newspaper there for a while. But technically, Huntsman Echo really is Shelton, and they kind of, they have the marker and everything for it, so we'll let them take it. But in the river, um, there were three different newspapers published. The first one was called the Gazette. Uh, it was published on, uh, the first issue was September 9th, 1881. R.H. Miller um, was the publisher there. Uh, he only ran it for about a year before he sold it to James Ewing, who ran it until the 18th. 1992. Again, don't know for sure, but the financial crisis of the 1890s certainly couldn't have been helpful to newspapers. So it stopped publishing in 1892. However, a short time later, a newspaper started up again in Wood River, and this one was called the Wood River Interest. Um, the publisher of that was Owen Quackenbush, and he established the interest in 1894, published a paper, and practiced law. He was a lawyer. He even trained as a lawyer. Um, he got to the University of Nebraska. So he set up his law office and his newspaper business in Wood River. And so he was doing both there. Um, until July of 1919, when he decided he wanted to be a lawyer full time instead of a newspaper man. <laughs> so he sold out his interest um, in the, he sold out his interest, no pun intended, uh, to W.W. W. Walton, who um, ran the Sunbeam. And then um, Quackenbush moved to Grand Island and became a lawyer full time. So the Sunbeam was established first by a man by the name of C.C. Johns in 1899. And he ran the newspaper there um, until he sold it to a man by the name of William Ward, or they refer to him all the time as just as W.W. W. Uh, Malman. Um, when Johns moved to Kennesaw in 1905. And so, um, and I haven't, I didn't have the exact year, 
Maltman eventually did sell out. They had some other things that it went through. But the Whitaker Sunbeam continued operations um, for several years until the Clipper in Shelton um, acquired an interest. And the Clipper continued to publish the Sunbeam as its own paper. They published the Shelton Clipper and they published the Whitaker Sunbeam for a period of time. Um, but then in 2017, they actually merged them into one paper. So now it's not just called the Shelton Clipper, it's called the Clipper. Um, and they serve, as I said earlier, um, Carol River, Alva, Shelton. Carol River, Alva, Shelton. Given. Carol, Alva, whatever, Shelton, Given. Um, so basically, Western Hall County, Eastern Buffalo County is kind of their geographic area. So that, in a nutshell, so I want to talk to you a little bit about the Newspaper Project too. It's just a really brief history of all of the different newspapers we publish in Hall County. So we have a really, really rich history um, that's published in newsprint. And the thing about newspapers is, I talk to you all the time about why this project that we're doing is so important. A newspaper often is the first record of the history of a community. Before there is books written, there's usually a newspaper. And there is so much information that you can find in old newspapers. Of course, you find things like birth notices, sometimes death notices, people were married. Um, but then there's all kinds of other little life events that happen in the newspapers. And I have a lady I met um, at the Grand Island Library one day when we were getting ready to start the newspaper project. And she was telling me, um, I was waiting on the microphone reader she was using. And um, she was telling me she lived in um, Minnesota, but she actually was from this area originally. And she was doing some research while she was back. She was with her family. And so we kind of talked, and I said, you know, we had this project coming up, the newspaper project. She goes, oh, that's great. She said, um, her family actually was in um, Howard County and Hall County, kind of the northern part of Hall County. And she said, uh, she gets on the Howard County site all the time looking for newspapers about information on her family. And she said, maybe you can tell me about this. There was this newspaper, and I only am getting one side of the story, and it involved her great-grandfather, her great-grandfather. Um, but there was a newspaper in Howard County that was publishing this story, and it was kind of a continuing story, and it went back and forth. And she said, there's a newspaper called the Free Press, and I can't find it on their website. Do you know why? I said, yes, I know why, because that's a Hall County newspaper. Uh, and here's the microfilm for it. But she was only getting one half of the story because she was getting the Howard County newspaper who was telling one version, and the Hall County newspaper apparently had another version, so she was missing half the story. Um, so, I, and again, I'm not really sure exactly what that story was, but there's so much information that can be found in old newspapers. Which leads me to what we are trying to accomplish. So, the Hall County Newspaper Digitization Project um, is the largest collaborative effort that the Historical Society has been a part of. It isn't our largest project because obviously Don's got me beat, <laughs> money-wise, um, but it is our largest collaborative project. And so what we've done is the Historical Society is taking the lead on this. Everyone's been wanting to have these fingers digitized, but no one can do it on their own. So what we've done is we've brought together the two museums in Hall County, Kara Roots and Stir Museum, and we've brought together the three newspapers, the Clipper, um, which again is the Woodward Alva Carroll area, the Donovan Herald, and the Grand Island Independent, and we've brought together the libraries, uh, the Grand Island Public Library and the Maltman uh, Library and whatever, and then the Genealogy Society. So all of us are working together and trying to find funding to get this project up and going. Um, because again, we all want to have this project up and going. Um, this is all something we wanted to do. How many people have used microfilm? Okay. Um, it's, it needs updated. Oh, it really needs updated. It is, it is a pain to use. It's hard to find things. I mean, it's kind of like a needle in a haystack. And then you sit in front of that microfilm reader and it's kind of going, and you're kind of like, you know, sometimes you easily miss things. Um, it's not very accessible. You have to go to a library or a museum or somewhere that they have it. 
Um, so it's, and it's great. Whoever was a part of the original microfilming project, kudos to them. Because what they did was they took those old newspapers that were literally falling apart and turned into dust. They made images of them and they made them accessible to us who the newspapers are kind of um, leery of letting people go into their morgues and touch their old papers because again, they, can help, they fall apart. Um, but we can actually access those papers through a microfilm. But that was the 1960s, 1970s. Uh, microfilm readers um, are aging rapidly. Sometimes they are hard to keep up and running. Um, and then also there's money involved with buying those reels of microfilm and those newspapers get to digitize. And plus two, newspapers, a lot of them now are all online, so there's not a lot of microfilming anymore going on anyway. So what we want to do is we want to take those newspapers that were already put onto microfilm and we're going to convert them to digital. So how are we going to do that? Um, the how is pretty easy. Um, it's the, once we get the money in place, and that's what we've been working on, there is a company in Iowa, it's called Advantage Preservation, and they have worked with over 500 libraries, museums, newspaper offices, historical societies, genealogy societies, all across the country to digitize their newspapers. It's really what they do. So, working with Advantage Preservation, what we're going to do, they have an agreement in place with the Nebraska State Historical Society um, to get the microphone directly from them. They take it over to their plant in Iowa. They run it through their machines, and then they kind of clean it up. Because sometimes, especially if you look at old microfilm, um, it's a little you know, dark and things. So they kind of clean it up to make it a little bit easier to see. And then they do what's called OCR which makes it searchable. And I'll show you that in a minute. Um, so one of the things too, Advantage Preservation and us working with them, um, the Nebraska State Historical Society for some reason, I don't know why, is missing some of our reels. Um, however, some of them I found at the Brown Library and I've worked on an arrangement with Steve for the library that he would loan those to them um, so we can get as much of uh, the newspapers as we possibly can. Um, but what we're doing is going to work with Advantage Preservation. And uh, talking about Nebraska in particular, there are over 21 counties right now in Nebraska that have digitized their newspapers. And this is the list, and if anyone you know, wants it, just let me know and I can get that to you too. Or you can go on to Advantage Preservation site and type Nebraska, you can see all those. Um, and then, so when we started this project back in April with all of our partners, um, we talked about what we were wanting to do, what we were wanting to accomplish, and how much money we needed to raise to get this done. And we also, we have to be um, sensitive to copyright issues with the newspapers as well. So that's why we have the newspapers that we've been working with them. On the Grand Island Independent, what we found out before Don Smith retired, he um, found out from the Media that they had entered into an agreement, it took us a while to figure all this out. They entered into an agreement in 2016 um, as a part of their umbrella company to have their newspapers back to 1924, digitized by a company called Newsbank. Um, if anyone has ever worked with Newsbank, um, it is a paid service. Um, so what we are doing, the things that we're doing, you don't have to pay. You don't have to have a subscription to get to. But we also can't infringe on the agreement with the um, independent house with Newsbank or the independent parent company has with Newsbank. So before Don retired, what he was able to get me was we can digitize the ground independent to 1924, and then we can digitize all of the other newspapers because we have permission from the publishers who are still publishing. And then those are the defunct, it doesn't matter, there's no one that can tell us we can't. Um, but what that really did for us, it helped us one, the newspapers are still going to get digitized. It's going to be through Newsbank. The Grand Island Public Library has a subscription to Newsbank. 
Um, so if you have a library card, you can access it. Steve told me you can access it from home or you can go into the library there and access the independent after 1924 through News Bank at the library. Up to 1924, it's gonna be on our site, which is gonna be open to everyone. The other really cool thing, it took our project from having to raise $150,000 to only having to raise $50,000. So um, it's going to get done, and we just don't have to raise the money to do it. So that's really cool. Uh, like Fred had talked about, we launched this project in <coughs> May during the Golden Year. Uh, the Historical Society Board voted to have two thirds of all of the undesignated funds from Golden Year go to the News Group Project, and then anyone who designated the News Group Project specifically. 100% of those donations would go to the News Group Project. So where we stand today, um, we are ready. This is the big drum roll freeze. We have released the first 100 reels of microfilm. So we have three newspapers that have been entirely sponsored. The Platte Valley Independent, Maggie's newspaper, I sponsored that one myself. The Wood River Sunbeam, Don Moyer from Wood River, sponsored the Sunbeam, so the entire history of the Sunbeam. Um, the Wood River Gazette was sponsored by um, my brother, actually, Eric Nielsen. Um, and then to figure out how we're going to get those 100 rolls, get to that point of 100, well, we kind of, kind of picked and choose. Um, Don, the Granville Times was the next chronological newspaper. Um, the Donovan Eagle was one roll, so that was kind of easy to pick that one. We picked the German newspapers. Um, those are the ones the State Historical Society didn't have for some reason, um, but they, they only had one reel. The other 14 were missing, I don't know why. Um, but Steve, the library, is, sent those off to Iowa. And then the Grenoble Independent from 1884 to 1899. So those are the first 100 reels of microfilm. And it should be, they, they're being sent to a gauge preservation now, and they'll start the process. It'll take about two months. So by the end of this year, we should have those first newspapers online and people can start to see them. What we were really trying to accomplish with that first 100 is we still have about $35,000 we have to raise. So we thought if we get that first 100 out, um, maybe it will entice people to contribute to the project so they can see what it's going to be. Um, but we're going to continue to fundraise. I've written some grants that we're waiting to hear on. I've contacted some um, businesses and individuals that hopefully might donate to the project. Um, if any of you are interested in sponsoring the project at all, every dollar helps. Seriously. doesn't matter how little or big the donation is. Every dollar helps. If we, that $50,000 goal that we had, think about it this way. If we had every single person in Grand Island give $1, we would have more than enough money to do this. So every dollar helps, every dollar counts. Um, one of the things that we've committed to all of our partners, because like I said, this will be accessible online, on the internet, wherever you are, but because we wanna make sure that it's always preserved, Advantage Preservation gives us one hard drive with all of the images, so all of the pictures, that can be accessed offline anytime. What we, the Historical Society, have committed to our partners is we are going to purchase additional hard drives to be placed in the libraries at Stern Museum, Carol Woods, the libraries at uh, Woodward and Grand Island, and then each of the newspaper offices, as well as here at the historical site, we're going to keep our own copy too. Uh, so that's what our next steps are. If anyone is interested in sponsoring an entire paper, and I've got sheets up here too, you're welcome to take. Um, these are the subscriptions that are still available. Um, the independent, what we did is we broke the independent down into a yearly subscription. So it's $500 if you want to subscribe to the independent from 1900 to 1924. Um, and these are the other newspapers that are available too. Um, like, like I said, you know, if you want to purchase the Angel Monopolist, Fred Henney's newspaper, it's $150. Anyone who sponsors an, an entire newspaper or a year of the independent 
or gives a major gift of $2,500 or more is going to be recognized on the home page of the site. So those subscriptions are still available. With that, I wanted to kind of show you what you can expect when you get out to the website. These aren't ours, obviously, because we're not live yet, but I have some examples here. Do this backwards and upside down, so bear with me. Okay, this is um, the St. Paul website, and um, one of the things too I, I tell people all the time, and this is a little side note. I have someone who, uh, a friend of my husband's one time that was commenting about Facebook and people posting on Facebook and, oh my gosh, why would you post all that stuff on Facebook because everyone knows your business? I'm like, seriously, dude, you're from Oregon. You think everyone doesn't know your business anyway? Um, but the other thing is, if you think Facebook is up in your business, my grandma was a community correspondent for the Wallbeck Messenger and the Phonograph Herald. I can go on the Howard County website type my name and find out every time I ate dinner at my grandma's house, every time I spent the night at my aunt's house, you know, every time we had a wedding, funeral, bridal shower, whatever, what people wore, what they ate, you know, everything. Community correspondents were like the ancestor of Facebook, let me tell you. So there's so much information you can find online. I won't like show you all my information, but um, what I am going to show you is a couple things. So this is essentially how our site will look, basically. And you can see all the different Howard County newspapers there, all the different years. You can click on a certain newspaper, like if I was wanting to look into the Photograph Herald. And then you can look, you know, pick your decade. Drill down to a specific year. Maybe find a specific day newspaper that you were looking at. And then if you click right here, It is the newspaper, just as you would have read it on that day. You can flip through every single page. There's eight pages of this newspaper. You can read every single page and flip through it all if you want. That's one way you can search. You can also search if you're looking by certain years, like on one side, it had Over here, what's got browsed by years, you can search by years to the same idea that we just did. Or you can um, narrow your search by certain words, by certain dates. Like I said, it, right here where it says find people, places, events, if I typed my name in there, <laughs> no, I'm not going to do it. I am going to do something else. Uh, and you can narrow down the time frame. You can say all of these words, any of these words. Um, you can pick exact phrases, but what I'm going to do, because when I was showing this to the board um, and showed them these sites, the next board meeting, Fred came back and he's like, I never knew that that's really how Stolly Park came to be Stolly Park. So, oops, if I can type. Here's the 
article on how Stolly Park means Dolly State Park. So it was a piece of Fred's history that he never knew before, <coughs> and it was published in the St. Paul newspaper. Um, and because it's been digitized, he was able to go out and type a couple of keywords and find that information. Kind of cool, right? So um, it's not just Howard County. Our neighbors to the east, Merritt County, have already got their newspaper digitized too. And I want to show you theirs. <coughs> Again, you see it looks exactly the same, and you can narrow down time frames if you want, but you can type keywords. Oh, it didn't work. I didn't type it right. Let's go back and do something different here. These are from microfilm. The microfilm took the original papers and these are taking the microfilm. So yeah, here's an article about Fred Hetty. Um, there is an article, and that was what I was going to try to do, and I didn't type it right, but um, talking about there was a war between Maggie Mobley and Fred Hetty, and, and the newspaper in Central City said Hetty ought to know better than to quarrel with a woman, you know, kind of stuff like that. So. There's a lot of, I mean, you can type all kinds of different things in there, search all kinds of information, find things about your ancestors, find things about community history. Um, there's just a wealth of information available online, um, and more and more so every day. And I would love, 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 um, by next summer to have all of the Hall County newspapers, including the Independent up to 1924, online and accessible to anyone, whether they be a family historian, whether they be a community historian, whether they be a middle school student who's doing a research project. I would love for them to be able to go online, type in some keywords, read those old newspapers. I think teachers can use these in their classrooms, talking about community history. There's so much out there that could be done. Um, so I strongly encourage, if anyone is interested in supporting the project, um, every dollar helps, every dollar counts. I know there's a donation jar over there. Anything that you donate to that donation jar today goes straight to the newspaper project. But again, if you want to do a bigger donation, a certain newspaper, a certain year, um, or if you just want more information, there's sheets up here. Feel free to take them. So are there any questions that anyone has I can try to answer? I live in Shelton, uh -huh. and I'm in the historical society, so we have all the covers. Uh -huh. um, the microfilm doesn't go very late. Uh, I mean, I can't remember exactly where it stops. The library has it, but there's no way to, to print it off. So they have a microfilm reader, but they don't have a printer. Yes. Which sometimes happens, too, yes. in smaller towns. So when people call me, I have to go find it. Right now, I take a picture with my smartphone, and then I send it to them. That's the best mm -hmm. I can do. So. Yeah, and you can print things off, you know, from here. My question was, I wonder if some of those readers that are out there somewhere, like our little, our little library doesn't have much money, mm -hmm. they get a hold of one when they go this way, it'd be better than nothing if one of the printers, you know? Mm -hmm. Yeah. I don't know. Yeah. Oh, and I can, um, I know that looks kind of small. <coughs> you can um, make these bigger, smaller, whatever you need, just read them too. That's the official repository for the state. Even though there's other repositories around that have microfilm, the State Historical Society is the official repository. The Grand Island Library and the Independent itself have the Independent on microfilm back to 1886. Mm -hmm. Yep. Are you envisioning a little further down the road, pushing it all that far back? Um, actually, we are the, the independent 
1884 to 1899 is in that first 100 reels oh, okay. that are already um, being sent to Iowa. Yeah. Someone has a question? How can you find out if uh, a particular newspaper somewhere else in another state or something is digitized? If they're digitized, um, if they've done it through Advantage Preservation, they do have a really good directory of libraries around the state. That map that I showed you, um, you can actually zoom in on that map and find things too. There's other ways of digitizing as well, and different newspapers have done different things. There's, um, of course, the news bank. Like I said, that's a subscription-based service. Um, there's one called Newspaper Archives. Um, there's another one, I can't think of it right now. Um, some libraries have done their own. So like my husband, he's from Ord, and um, the Ord Library years ago digitized all their own records. Um, and you can access it, you actually have to go to that, that library's website, and then you can access it that way. Some of those libraries, um, you'll notice too on that list of Nebraska, some of them you go to and you click on to get this page, and it says not available. What one thing that has happened in some of the cases is they digitize the newspapers, but they want to make people come into the library. So you have to go physically to that library to be, be able to access it. Um, it's not available online. We're not doing that. We're raising all the money so that we can have it accessible to everyone. And you don't have to physically go to a location. You can sit at home in your PJs at five o'clock in the morning or whenever you wake up and get online and you know search for the newspapers if you want. What is the status of what the independent is doing? Is that done and available? Or do you know? So what Don told me was what he'd been told from corporate before he retired, um, he'd been working really hard for us to try to get this information. And he said that Newsbank had an agreement they signed with um, BH Media and they were about two-thirds of the way through the process. Now BH Media is really big. It's the Omaha World Herald, it's the New York Times, it's the North Platte Telegraph, it's the Carney Hub, it's the Grinnell Independent. So that two-thirds, I don't know where it is, but I have not seen Newsbank yet have any, because you can see the Independent on Newsbank like back to about hmm, 2001, um, and I actually have a Newsbank subscription or access to Newsbank through UNK. I have the access to the UNK library. So you can see the, the independent back to about 2001. I can't see the independent any farther back, so I don't know where that actually is in their process, but Don said that he was told they were about two thirds of the way through their digitization with the Newsbank. Any other questions? Well, I appreciate all of you coming out. Um, it's a really nice day, so it's nice that you're in here with us. I don't think we're going to get fewer and fewer of these nice days as we progress because we went from summer to winter, like that. Um, but uh, you're welcome to stay and enjoy some refreshments. And like I said, if you want to grab a paper, if you want to make a donation, we'll gladly take it. Hall County Historical Society, tax deductible. Um, so yes, thank you very much.